Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4. We're going to be in here one more time. Actually, a few more times, but at least for today, one more time again. We're going to read um, a little bit more than, than where we're going to be in today, but I want you to remember where we've been. I don't want to just read the two verses we're going to focus on, but Galatians 4, verse 12. We'll start there. This will give us an idea of where Paul is coming from in the heart of this pastor and this apostle. Verse 12 starts off, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I has also become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God and as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you, and not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you." It's going to be a particularly strong message today, a little sobering, because last week we asked the question, and we're going to continue to answer the question, how do you know if the person who's speaking before you, even right now, is speaking the words for God, and can I trust Him? Because what we see in this text is Paul is being questioned by some people, because of other teachers that have come in after Paul left. And you can add, how do we know if other teachers that we may follow online or whatever, how do we know if they're good teachers? How do we know if we should be following them? Why should I trust them? Often our gut is all we use to test uh, a speak, a speaker, a speech, I was going to say a speech, but, or a speaker, um, uh, someone who would get up behind a pulpit and, and give a, a, a sermon or a talk or a message. And often it's just our reaction is just going to be what the, the measure, our gut is just going to tell us uh, this pure, a purely emotional deal. Um, do they seem positive? Were they or they, were they light and, and positive and they weren't too aggressive? The stories seem kind of interesting or funny. Nothing makes me want to reject this person outright. The conclusion then is that their works were, their words were pretty good and it seemed like I learned something about myself. I learned how to cope with a few issues that I find in myself. And bottom line usually is it's not really alarming for me to worry about anything in there. There's just a few things I might want to tweak in myself. I mean, oh sure, we learn about the dangers of life, but it's pretty rare that we think about spiritual dangers. We just, well, we have a lot going on in our lives. We're, we have a lot of daily issues going on, so we need to make sure that we're on par with those things and we're making sure they're being taken care of. And we know mostly about spiritual truth anyway. I mean, for the most part, I mean, I believe in God, so it's not much more. And the pastor is supposed to build us up, give us kind of a pep talk on Sunday and kick us out onto the street on Monday so we can get ready to go out there and do the kingdom work and live like Jesus. And this could describe likely the sentiment that most, probably, I would say, 80 to 90% of the churches in America or even in the world preach today. This is the message that most Christians get. There's no sense of urgency, no sense of awareness, there's no sense of discernment. I had kind of an interesting story to tell, which I just 
talked about, but I think it'll help un- illustrate what I'm saying here. Uh, my, you don't have to forgive me, Melinda, but uh, this is about us. So when we first got married, and I warned you anyway, so uh, when we first got married, uh, we went to North Georgia for our honeymoon. And we went on a lot of hiking trips for the most of the week, and it was fun. I had a good time. It was, uh, and it was not too long. It was 2018, so it was just after. It wasn't before. It was before Michael, uh, several months before Michael. But there was another hurricane that had gone through. I think I can't remember when, but and it sat over North Carolina. You, remember, you might remember that for almost a week. I think it just dumped rain for a long time, for several days, and northern Georgia was part of that and they got a lot of that and so a lot of the trails were closed uh, for several months prior to us getting there and so uh, my was concerned uh, like uh, I used to talk about our duck we had ducks and chickens and the male duck would always be watching out the female chickens are running all over the place and the how he always had his we call him Howie he always had his eye up to the sky watching for hawks and predators and and uh, that's kind of what I felt like I felt like I'm always looking out for you know, no humans have been on this trail for almost six or seven, eight months. We're probably some of the first people that have even been out here. And I'm thinking animal life must have kind of thought, okay, humans are gone. They haven't been around. So I'm kind of freaked out about bears a little bit, you know. And all I got is my little knife that I'm carrying with me. I think Brendan gave it to me. but um, Well, she was making fun of me all week long because of that. And so... Uh, and it just so happened that towards the end of our trip, I took a little walk from our little cottage, which we had rented in the woods there. And uh, I was probably from here to the end of the driveway to the street away from the house. And I saw a bear right near the front door of the house. And she had the front door wide open. And it was probably from me to you guys. I mean, it wasn't very far, maybe 20 feet. And I just thought, Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is really happening. And there was a bear, right there. and it wasn't huge, but still, it was a bear, and the door was wide open. And she was laying right there on the couch, just around the corner from that bear. And I thought, man, if he just goes inside there, it's all over. And so I wanted to show you this because I feel like, of course, I never let it, never let her, never, never let her live it down. And she's, and I'm even bringing it up now, but um, she's. You know, still made fun of me for my bear, you know, what, yeah, phobia, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> so anyway, um, but I wanted to illustrate how close we can be to danger and not be aware of the utter danger just right around the corner. And this is exactly where the Galatian churches find themselves. Uh, and many churches right now find, our, find themselves this way, as I've been saying, I want to quote to you from Mike Todd from Transformation Church in, on their Easter Sunday service in 2023 um, before doing their Easter play, which he said prior that would include everything leading up to sin. I mean, everything would be in this play except sin itself. They would do everything, throw the whole works in there. And if you know anything about their church, they lived up to that. And if you can go look up their Easter service, It's very appalling. As he introduced the play that way, I want you to hear what he said as he began that specific talk. It's just one sentence, but it's so telling. In 2025, this is Mike Todd, I became the pastor and I didn't even know what a pastor did. This is what he was saying to lead you up to understand why they do the kind of Easter services that they do. He didn't even want to preach the word. He didn't even think it was necessary. The entire service was dedicated to a play. There is no preaching of the word. That's it. It's their play. I didn't even know what a pastor did. This is how close to danger these churches are getting. And if you were... By the way, I'm not cracking on him as being a young man, a young pastor. I understand what it's like to be a new pastor and and, and be unaware of certain aspects of the faith. But I know what I'm supposed to do as coming into a pastor. I think any man that steps behind here, they should know that their job is to feed the sheep. 
and to protect the sheep. That's what their job is to do, to feed the flock, to protect the flock. It's God's flock, it's not ours. Mike Todd ultimately, ultimately makes a decision to not even preach the word. And you'll see why I say that in a second, because that was in 2023, but, and he's talking about him his first thing, but nothing happened, nothing that happened at that Easter play should have surprised anyone. And again, recently, when he started showing how he illustrates, it's not really that important to worry about how you worship. And he says this. Of course, while he's singing worship lyrics, he's got a stage set up to look like a church, a little pew, a section of chairs or pews, and then a pulpit over here with a communion table, and he's got a Bible on it with a little bit of communion, and he starts throwing stuff all over the tables, pouring drinks on the seats, and then he takes syrup, pours it all over the communion, pours it on top of an open Bible. He goes, oh, come on. And he says this as he's doing this. He says, don't care so much. Y'all stop acting like you care about this. Stop acting like this matters to you. Because people were rightly protesting. But this is their church. This is who they accepted in there and their pastorate. Why does this kind of behavior surprise anyone? From the pastor who says, sometimes I do extreme things to get to help people get it. This is wildly different from how the apostles did their ministry. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, Paul says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. And even Peter, the apostle Peter, so it wasn't just one lone wolf here, it was another, another pastor, 2 Peter 1, 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. But Peter warns later, many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And not long after penning those words, we don't know how long, but Peter lost his life for the gospel. The true shepherd dies to protect the flock. The true shepherd dies to protect the truth. So the gospel goes forward to all men. Lives and souls hang in the balance. And Paul is doing that here in his Galatian churches. He's laboring again, as we'll see, for the truth. What he said in verse 19. My children with whom I am again in labor. He labored. We talked about Paul's near-death experience just to bring the gospel to these people when, he first, when they first got saved. And now he's again in labor for this same group of people. This is the drive that's in the pastor's heart to protect them. Not to pour syrup all over the communion and, and the Bible. The only thing that would protect someone from the eternity, the eternity of hell. And he's pouring syrup on it like it's nothing, like it's no big deal. So this whole letter then has been one giant call to the churches in Galatia to repent. Speaking to believers here, he's not talking to the unbelievers. He's, he's getting onto the believers' cases. You, you who once claimed to be saved by the gospel that I preached. Because even believers need to be reminded of the truth. We can get on our, into our daily lives so much so that we start forgetting about where we came from and what God did for us. And while we would probably not deny Christ, we start following in some pretty wild things sometimes. And we go to churches that do things and, and they, they lead us in wrong ways. And so he's reminding them of their salvation. And he did that by way of their election. Remember, he, he was talking about how God first came to them. He wasn't even planning to go to them, as we said last week. So he's moving to discredit then these spiritual leaders, which is why I'm bringing up some of these other examples. I'm not just doing them for the shock value or whatever. I'm doing that so you guys will understand that there's, those people exist today. So as Paul is trying to call these Galatians to repentance, we're going to notice a couple things about false ministers. 
just two things, basically. One, they are enemies of the truth. And two, they are enemies of the kingdom. What I would like you to see is how Paul shows that these, these men, these are not men that you should even be following or listening to at all. These men are not pastoral. They do not have your best interest at heart. These men are enemies of the truth. The report had to been coming back to Paul about their, this congregation or these congregations. And now he's writing to them. Keep in mind that these cultures are absolutely steeped in a culture of, uh, of pagan works-based religions. The pagan cultures, the Greek and Romans, they did not have a high view of their gods. They didn't have their gods, were not moral gods. Oftentimes their temperaments were uh, wicked, sinful, so the pagan in this system then had to work their way to appease the gods, to make them happy so they could get rain for their crops or put their children in the fire so that would, they would have a plentiful year, a bountiful year. This is what they did. So it made sense to them when the Judaizers come in after Paul had helped move them from unbelief to belief in Christ. Or you could say converted them. So it makes sense that when they, when these guys came in, these Judaizers, these religious guys from Islam, uh, Islam from uh, Jerusalem, that they're teaching you got to follow these things. They're already used to a works-based religion. Oh, okay. Paul taught us about Jesus, but I guess we got to do these other things to kind of keep the ball rolling. And listen, the problem is that's a false gospel. That's what. He's been working to say in Galatians 1 and on. Paul's gospel, true doctrinal gospel teaching says that we are free in Christ, we've been learning. Christ lived a sinless life for our sinless, sinful lives. He lived a sinless life for our sinful lives. He paid our debt. And the eternal consequences applied to Christ, as we said just a little while ago, fully satisfying the debt that was required by God. Listen to the words of one of the songs that we sing in our hymns. And this is why we sing the songs that we do here. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid there in the death of Christ. I live. That's the gospel. And that's the gospel that these professors, these churches, said that they believed. This is the gospel message that Paul preached to them. This is what we trust in. We trust in the same exact message today that these people put their faith in. Our belief is no different. Our belief and our faith then is a gift given by God. You see no works anywhere in those words that I just read and anything that I've just been saying. The gospel then is believers. <clears throat> the gospel that these believers are going back to is no gospel at all because now they're going to a workspace system which they never even had. They had their own pagan systems, but now these Judaizers are coming along telling them, well, that's great that you believe in Christ, but now you need to be circumcised and follow the Mosaic laws. And what Paul is saying is essentially the same thing that, that Jesus said, that this makes them double sons of hell if they have not actually believed. In Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said, just to such a crowd of teachers like this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around by sea and land to make one proselyte, that's a convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. The issue going on in verse 16, which is where I'm 
focus now is these people don't want to hear. They don't want to know that they're being misled. They don't want to be told the truth. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? And I can tell you right now, my own experience with other believers, they do not want to hear it. I have dear, dear friends of mine who, when I've warned them about the way that some of the churches that they're going to are, are going, they do not want to hear it. And I can tell you right now, we've not been invited back a lot of times with certain friends. There's been loss of friendship. And sometimes it's not always outright terminated. Sometimes they just ignore the text messages. They ignore the phone calls. Or they ignore your warning altogether and still invite you to stuff and pretend like you never even said anything. Because they just want to have some kind of a Christian unity. And I'm talking about pastors. Some of these men have been pastors I've warned and they don't even acknowledge that I've even said anything to them. Amos 5 says this way, They hate him who reproves, reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks the truth. The gate was their court. That's where they held their court. Everything was done at the gate. That's like the city, the city center, the city, the city focus. They don't want to hear the truth. We've been going through first and second kings, and then we went through, now we're in Ezra and in Esther, and now we're going to, about, we're going to go to Nehemiah, the history of Israel in first kings 22, the king of Israel, Ahab, and the king of uh, Judah, Jehoshaphat. We're experiencing three years of peace, and they're trying to figure out if they should invade Syria or not. Why don't you turn to 1 Kings real quick. Let's go look at 1 Kings 22. This is an interesting little story. I think you should hear it. Verse, or, uh, 1 Kings 22, chapter 22. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to hit some highlights here. Verse 2, and it came about in the third year that Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. That's Ahab. Remember Ahab and Jezebel? You guys have probably heard that, those words before. You remember those? Now the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? This is Ahab speaking. And we are still, we will still do nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle with Ramoth Gilead? Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said, to the king of Israel, I am as you are. Your people are my people. My horses are your horses. We're all of one brother. We're all, we're all Jews, right? Sure, we'll back you. Moreover, the king, or Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, verse 5, please inquire first the word of the Lord. Jehoshaphat's wanting to go find out what God says about this. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it to you, and he'll give, he'll give it to you into your hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not yet a prophet of the Lord? That's an interesting little statement. Why do he say that? Why do he question the 400 prophets? Well, because you remember... Israel was separated now. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The temple was in the southern kingdom. But they had made a false temple in the northern kingdom. And they weren't supposed to. They were supposed to make the trip down to Jerusalem. But they had created a false system of works. And they had their own priests who weren't in the line of Aaron, which they were supposed to be. So these are the priests that... Ahab was going to, and they all wanted to make Ahab feel good about himself. And Jehoshaphat says, Is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire? And notice his reaction in verse 8. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Why? Because he does not prophesy good concerning me but evil. He is Micaiah, son of Emelah, 
And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, let's hear from this guy. And they say, okay, fine, verse 9, call him quickly, bring him in here, and we'll skip around a little bit. They're going to try and butter up Micaiah to give him the good news. 14, Micaiah says, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. So then he's brought before Ahab. And when he came to the king, verse 15, the king says, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go and succeed. The Lord will give it into your hand. He's being completely sarcastic. King doesn't, the king doesn't miss this. The king says, verse 16, How many times must I adjure you to tell me the truth? Speak nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. In other words, don't go. And the king of Israel figured out what he was saying and he turned to Jehoshaphat and said, Did I not tell you that this guy always not, will not prophesy good concerning me but evil? In other words, he doesn't want to hear the truth. That's what's at stake here. And we're not going to read the rest of that. You can, I'll just give you the, the spoiler alert at the end here. King Ahab goes out and dies. They don't want to hear it. People don't want to be told that they are wrong. This is why evangelism is so hard. And they will go to great lengths to cover up or shut someone up, just like the rest of that said, that little exchange there. They put Micaiah in prison to shut him up. This is a spiritual attack. This is a spiritual attack on the truth. That's what's at stake here, verse 16 in Galatians 4. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? Listen, the truth goes forward to true believers. Right? And that's how we start off. We're told the truth. And maybe there's some time from maybe the first few times we hear the truth that, that, that goes through. In my life, it was almost, I think, 12 years or 10 or 11 years or something like that. I can't remember the exact number, but it was a long time between when I was first heard the gospel, felt the pull to, to become a disciple and ignored it and ignored it and ignored it. And my life went to down the tubes. But eventually, I heard the truth. Converts are made. This is how it happens. The truth is told. Romans 10 says that how will they believe if they've not heard? So we have to hear the gospel preached. And the converts are made. And then the church usually drops the ball at this point. Because what these people need most now is discipling. When you have a new baby, no one is like, hey, congratulations, we have a new baby. All right, got to go back to work on Monday and then leave the baby at home. No, you stay with the baby and you're there with it every moment of its day, of its life, until it can take care of itself. And then you start sending them to school and other things like that. No one has a problem with that, but churches often drop the ball. We wonder why there's so much false teaching in the church is because people aren't being discipled. They don't know how to discern from the truth, from error. They can't tell. They hear a few Christian words, some Christian lingo, and it sounds like it's something that would be in the Bible. This is how Mormons get away with doing what they do. They call themselves Christians. They talk about Jesus. They talk about Heavenly Father. Sounds like what, the stuff that we talk about. Except Heavenly Father was a man just like us and he has now become a God of his own and he has his own planet now that he governs, which is ours. And one day, if you aspire to be like him, you can do the same thing. Is that something the Christian faith that you guys have believed? Probably not. Most, some Mormons don't even know that. And that's in their own doctrine. So young, new disciples can be left alone and that's when the wolves come in. First Peter, Peter says this to the scattered churches, be of sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Don't get hung up on the word lion even though I just said wolves. It's, an, it's meant to communicate one simple point. 
they're out there and they're seeking you. And they're waiting for a church to drop the ball. They're waiting for someone to be saved and not be discipled. They're seeking you. New, new converts and disciples are easy. You ever watch those little videos of the, the animals out there in the, in, the, in the wild? They pick off the weak ones. They pick off the, sink, the sick ones, right? Or the babies, the young ones. I saw a video just last week, a mother giraffe protecting a little baby giraffe from about three or four lions. I won't tell you what happened. Jesus warned us this way, Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Someone says, well, we're not prophets, and we're not telling the future, so that's not us. It's a decent criticism. The word is pseudo prophetess. It has two meanings. One is a pretended foreteller. That's one meaning, which you could see in that text. But the context makes it clear. The second meaning of that word is, is the intended religious imposter. The context of our Lord's words there make that the right meaning. This is someone who's pretending to be a religious leader. That's the intention. They are flagrant offenders of the truth. They hate the true gospel because it nullifies their claims. They hate the gospel. They are hostile to the gospel of Christ. And they're not so obvious or else everyone would sniff them out, right? If a Mormon came up to you, as I was just saying, and said, hey, would you like to be the god of your own planet one day? You'd be like, hmm, I'm checking out of this conversation. You wouldn't even have the conversation. Like you'd say, no, I don't want to be my own God, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully that would be your response. But they don't do that. They come to you in clothing of Christianity. They know the lifestyle, they know the lingo. But upon closer inspection by anyone who's a decent student of Scripture, they can sniff it out. And oftentimes their lifestyle won't match the professions. But they know where to walk. They know how to talk. And they know when not to talk. But they can't hide forever. The word there in the Greek, Matthew 17, inwardly, isothen, interior. This is who they really are. This is who they really are. This is why most relationships don't last past about three or four years because you can only fake it for so long. You have two people and you hear about people that are always trying to uh, reinvent themselves for a new relationship. Why do you think they go bad after a few years? Because that's not who you really are. And you're only faking it. And you're trying. I'm not taking away the intention there, the, the, the motive. You're trying to be good. You're trying to adapt to a new system, but it's just not working. At, at some level, the interior of the person, you're not that way, and it, it comes out. I can't do it anymore, and I'm gone. It's over. And the light switch is turned off, and all emotion is, is drained from the relationship. This is who they are. This is who they really are. They are enemies of the truth. That's number one. Number two, verse 17, they are eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. And remember, it's important to remember that Paul is talking to believers. He's not saying that, that you're not saved, but he's saying you're following these guys and they're leading, leading you away. Why would they do that? Well, he's going to go on to tell you that they're doing this for their own gain. And spiritually, in the world of spiritual warfare, Satan knows that a crippled Christian is weak for the gospel. He ain't doing much evangelizing if he's always worried about how sinful his life is. 
He's not doing much evangelizing if he doesn't even know how to evangelize. He doesn't know how to, he doesn't even really understand what the true gospel is or how to articulate it to someone else or how to combat false accusations or if someone has questions or objections, they can't even, they can't, they can't argue that back. They can't give a good reason for their faith. And the enemy knows this. This is why they're enemies of the kingdom. These are not frivolous accusations that Paul is throwing out here, especially regarding these false teachers, and nor are they untrue. But as we said, people are going to evade the truth, especially when they're deceived. So he's got to shock them now with the reality of what's going on here. And this is the blunt discussion that he's having. People don't like this. When I bring up names, they don't like that. I heard about a pastor today who was saying he has not been invited, not today, but this week, he's been saying his group of pastor friends is getting smaller as he gets older in the ministry. Because he's not getting invited to speak at other churches because he's doing the work that others are avoiding. The reality is, for this situation, in Paul's these, in this letter is these congregations are being sought by false shepherds, and there's nothing wrong with someone seeking to attend to a flock. That is the godly desire that's been put into a man's heart by by the Lord, a calling to seek to teach and train up believers, and and help others come to new faith. So there's nothing wrong with seeking to feed them or protect them in a loving manner. That, but that's not what's happening here. That's, not what he, that's what Paul is saying. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but to, they wish to shut you out. Anyone who's in ministry and avoids truth has ulterior motives. We could say that. And some may think in their service they're offering something to God, John 16. They will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Granted, this might be an extreme. We're not talking about getting killed for our belief. But I believe even misguided Christians perhaps who are maybe leaders, maybe not even leaders, they can have this kind of misconception that they're doing something helpful for God and they're not. Benny Hinn, as one of them, has been saying, well, he said for a long, a long time ago, well, actually not too long ago, that he'd like to take his Holy Ghost machine gun and mow down people like me that, that criticize his ministry. He likes to wipe out his critics with the Holy Ghost machine gun. But I know that's not a Christian thing, he'll go on to say, so I shouldn't really talk like that. Well, then why did you say it? But notice the adverb in verse 17, and not commendably, that adjusts the, the verb there by seeking commendably. This modifies the meaning. This, these are people who don't seek you commendably. Since the true pastor seeks out to feed and protect the flock, What is the false shepherd doing? What does he seek to do? Ezekiel 34 has something to say about that. Listen to this. Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. This is verse 2. And prophesy and say that those shepherds, thus says the Lord of God, uh, Lord God, woe to shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The, the scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and severity, you have dominated them. This is what they do. They seek to 
consume the flock. False teachers, false preachers use the elect of God who are unsuspecting with little discipleship or none to prop themselves up. That's how they get away with it. Some people go, how does the church get away with stuff like that? How, do they, how, do they, how does God let them do that? I mean, I think that's a judgment on them. Anyone who sits under them for a long time, like Joel Osteen's church, churches like that, they're a judgment on the people that sit there for decades. And they don't mind sitting there and, and consuming. Now, there are those who are in those churches who will be truly saved and, and are truly saved. And they will come out of that at some point. God will pull his sheep out, as Jude says, snatching those from the fire. Verse 17, they wish to shut you out. This is not to say that they, need to be, that they wish to shut you out of church. That would be opposite of what their goal is. But they're shutting you out from the truth. Recently, I saw a video by Isaiah Saldivar, who's one of these wildly popular up-and-coming demon slayers. He calls himself a demon slayer. That's their own nickname. Um, he used an AI video to show himself having a conversation with the Apostle Paul in this line that was on the Great White Day, the, the Judgment Day, the throne, the Great White Throne of Judgment. And he's in line, and the Apostle Paul, and he's sitting there talking to him. He says, hey, aren't you the Apostle Paul? And the Apostle Paul says, yeah, I'm the very one and all that. And there was a little conversation. And the Apostle Paul asked him, what did you do for... He never really says what the question was, but you kind of get the impl implication. What did you do for God? What did you do for Christ? What did you do for Jesus? What did you do for the kingdom? And you're left to kind of figure that out for yourself in the video, but the unbeliever hears what? How do I get to heaven? Well, I guess I'm supposed to be doing these good works that Isaiah starts to go talking about. All these ministries that you're supposed to be doing. These, these things for God you're supposed to be doing. And these people might be going to their church and what they need to hear is the gospel. Not leaving it up to your own imagination to figure it out and maybe, well, obviously, if I'm in, if I'm in line to be judged with, with the Apostle Paul, that means I better step it up if I'm going to get into heaven. That's the implication. Well, he says, Isaiah Saldivar says, I, well, I went to church on Sunday. So he's trying to tell you that you need to do more than that. And the whole video leaves it wide open to your interpretation. You can... Whatever you, whatever, whatever's better than attending church on Sunday is what you're supposed to do. So that's the picture that he's painted. To the unbeliever, good works will get you into heaven. To the believer, just do something for the church, even if it's especially giving to my ministry. Because you know that I'm a man of God. You know that I'm an apostle. I'm a demon slayer. I cast out demons. And it's terribly frightening to think that he's using... Such a teaching. Because literally people are going to line up to hear what Jesus predicted. Many will come to me on that day and say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, did we not cast out demons? And in your name, perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You worker of lawlessness. These false teachers are not building the kingdom of God. They are enemies of the kingdom. They're building their own ministry just as they believe a false gospel that no one, that saves no one. They build a kingdom that has no one in it. They're being shut out to the truth. Ecleo, separated, insulated. They're separated from the truth. They're insulated from the truth. And they're bound to the lies that they're being told. Because guess what? Uh, if you don't know how, I mean, where, look where you, where can you find how to slay a demon in the Bible? Oh, but he's got a class that'll show you. It's, a, it's an eight-step class, to, and you, you can pay him for it. So that this keeps you on the hook. You have to keep going back. Because that's where you have to go to seek your growth, to seek your blessings, to seek your breakthrough. 
And he even tells people, I have, he, he has regular ex demon exercises in himself every three months, like oil changes. Literally his words. I get myself a demon exercise out of me like an oil change every three months. I wish I was kidding about that. That's actually what they believe. Christians, they're saying, have this. Turn to 1 Timothy, and we're almost done. 1 Timothy, I'm going to... This kind of sums up... 1 Timothy 6 kind of sums up all that we've been saying. Just kind of let these words wash over you. First Timothy 6, verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord of Jesus Christ, and with a doctrine conforming to godliness, there's a key, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has a morbid interest in converse, controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil, and suspicions and constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved, deprived of the truth. There it is again. Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world so we can take nothing, anything out of it either. That sounds like Job, doesn't it? it sounds like a man of faith. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with a many a pang. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life of which you were called, and which and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, and that you keep the commandments without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time, just like your election, right? He who is, he who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immorality or immortality. Sorry, there's a little dash right there. <laughs> immortality and dwells in the unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Have you not yet committed to Christ? Then come to freedom that's found from sin and freedom from God's wrath on rebellion. Come to know the man who set himself in your place so that you could be free. That's Jesus Christ. On the other hand, have you already committed to Christ? Do you find yourself unable to grow in your understanding of truth? Do you find your spiritual life stagnant? Seek discipleship. This is a good church. This is a good church home that would have you studying Scripture on so many, in so many ways. The plugging in here, we're not just trying to get you plugged into a, quote, connect group just so you can have friends to fellowship with and, and to talk to, which is nice. The point that we have here, and I stress all the time, is the constant feeling of the word. As I said, the, the holding the hand or holding the, the little one, you know, when you have a little one and you, you constantly disciple them in life, that's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is being discipled and growing. Because once you get saved, the only things that mainly everyone talks about is, is coming to salvation and getting into heaven. And once you have salvation, you, you, you focus on the getting in the heaven part. And everything in between is like, well, well, we'll deal with whatever happens. But we'll have heaven one day. Amen. 
but we don't really talk about the middle section, and that's the section where we live. And that's where Paul's going in Galatians 5. He's going to our sanctification, our holiness, our godliness. We've been set apart by God to do good works, but he's got to get us there first. You don't just start on day one starting to do the good works. Remember, I talked about that last week. Some people think they're being commissioned on day one to do something. It's very rare in, in Scripture that that happens. Very rare. And to put yourself on the same plane as someone that has that happen one time, and maybe twice in the Bible, that's, that's, that's a little narcissistic. That doesn't happen to us on a regular basis like that. All of us mainly live, and in, in, uh, we all live in our, in our sanctification. That's where we grow in Christ. And so that's where we're trying to get you guys to go. That's why we have so many teachings and so many different ways of learning the Word. Anyway, let's go ahead and pray.